Hello and welcome once again to another review, a retro review for Cheap Shot Entertainment. It seems to be the only thing that I'm doing these days for the wrestling channel as I'm getting booked on more and more shows. If you want to check those shows out, go and check out DN Wrestling and also Aspire Community and Wrestling Alliance and you may just see a picture of my mug on those pages on social media. Also check out the Cheap Shot Entertainment social media, that is Instagram, Twitter and Facebook at various different handles, all available at the end of this video. So I hope you managed to get there. We're looking at a retro review, 2002, No Mercy 2002, which is an absolutely stacked card at the uh, in in Arkansas and um, is uh, yeah it's really really good pay per view watched this while I was on holiday took my Amazon Fire Stick with me and and just watched an old school pay per view on one night uh, and it was just amazing what a pay per view this is very much recommended took place on the twentieth of October two thousand and two um, in. Little Rock, Arkansas, in front of 10,000 people who bought tickets, and uh, yeah, really, really good. As ever, we also go through which games this is available on, and it's Smackdown, Here Comes the Pain, and Raw 2. I don't think there's going to be much difference in those in the coming months either. We're almost at the end of 2022. But we're also almost at the end of the 2002 pay-per-views uh, with Survivor Series being another massive one in the history of WWE as we know it. Um, so if you have watched this pay-per-view, were you there? Tell us, what did you think of it? We have a Hell in a Cell match, a title unification match and all other levels in between. It's really, really good. I'd suggest you go and watch it. It is available on WWE Network, or if you are in the US, I imagine it will be on Peacock as well. Um, let's get into the main part of the video. I'm really excited to review this one. Right, so we begin No Mercy 2002 at the All Tell Arena with a Sunday night heat match. It is the Hurricane versus Stephen Richards. Obviously, this one is not on the network, and the Hurricane defeats Stephen Richards, uh, who often says, I'll show you, you'll see. Obviously, he didn't on this occasion. First match of the night is for the World Tag Team Championships. It is Chris Jericho and Christian versus Goldust and Booker T. Two teams that have been thrown together. Normally would be singles competitors, but these two teams do have a really good rivalry. Um <clears throat> Chris Jericho and Christian are the current champions. Goldust and Booker T have a common enemy. They've been brought together to take on the champions. Um, and after a hard-fought match, the tag team champions do retain their tag team championships. Um, there is a rope... Oh, yeah, of course. The, uh, one of the spots goes very, very wrong. Uh, towards the end of the match and Jericho goes for a lion salt the rope breaks unceremoniously it wasn't meant to happen you can tell that by the way that Jericho landed uh, on the lion salt Jericho like the professional that he is gets up hits the bulldog and uh, on the title that Christian bought into the ring to finish this match off he does get a moonsault then for the pin. Um, obviously the rope is broken, so there's not much they can do with that. Um, and 
yeah, a really good match. Great match to open up. Uh, always good matches happen happening at the beginning of shows. I'm going to give this one three cheap shots out of five as the champions retained. There wasn't many hijinks. The only thing that went wrong really was the rope breaking. But sometimes, you know, those things happen. And we move on to the back now where Funaki, Smackdown's number one announcer, interviews Al Wilson about Dor Marie showing various clips of Dor Marie seducing Al Wilson. Lucky bugger. And, um, yeah, it, uh, it leads us to the next match. It is Dor Marie who is seducing Al Wilson, who, Al Wilson, who happens to be Tory Wilson's dad. Um, and, again, this match, really good. To say both of these two ladies had experience in being valets, managers, um, just being there for the bikini contest, these two actually put on a really good show. <coughs> Excuse me. They put on a really good match. Um, very basic, but sometimes that's all you need. And every single shot looked believable because they, they are having a rivalry. And that is exactly what you need it to be. Um, Dawn Marie puts, on, uh, puts up a good fight, but ultimately Tory Wilson was the winner here with a swinging neck breaker. Something you don't see a lot is a swinging neck breaker finish. Um <clears throat> At least um, nowadays and sort of 20 years ago, you know, things had to be much more elaborate and, and over over the top. Uh, swinging net breaker for the win. Tory wins. I'm going to give this two cheap shots out of five because, you know, it was a really good match. There was some technical issues. Um, but... You know, if these two were given more time, I would see both of them as as women's champion, as it was. Um, <clears throat> yeah, really enjoyed this one. Really good match. RVD in the back now being interviewed by the coach and uh, about his rivalry with Ric Flair. Um, you know, uh, with the last pay-per-view on Forgiven, Ric Flair turned his back on RVD. Um, and uh, RVD cuts a really good promo uh, with the chair swinging, Van Daminator kicking, and all that kind of stuff. It was a really good, really, really good um, promo. Um, and that leads us to Ric Flair versus RVD. Um, RVD obviously tries to take out Ric Flair with the fast moving pace of his offense. And the kicks and the flurries and things like that. Ric Flair would get the upper hand on RVD for quite a lot of this match, actually. Um, with the target being on the leg of, of uh, RVD to lock in the figure four. Um, and after a lot of backing and forthing, they, they went outside. They fought inside. Uh, as they often did in 2002. Um, RVD does eventually pick up the win with the five-star frog splash. Uh, possibly my favourite frog splash of all time. Because, uh, you know, it just looks so impactful. And if you're going to do something, make it look impactful. You know, just make it happen. Um, so, yeah, RVD gets the win. Going to give this one three out of five cheap shots as well. Uh, not real bad match on the card so far, and it only goes up and up and up from here. Now I'd usually break all these things up, but I've got them all written down before. Um, well, after after uh, watching the pay per view in whole, so um, we move on to the next. Promo, and this is really where it's you know it's broken up really well. As Stephanie talks to the Big Show, gives him some advice about how he's feeling, because uh, he's feeling like he's underutilized, underused. Um, he's a giant. He's an angry giant, and he should be used 
better. Bischoff interrupts and tries to boss the Big Show round. Big Show says he's a very angry giant and Big Show ends up manhandling Bischoff into the catering area, basically. Um, and, and Bischoff does a really good job here of looking very scared, um, like he's almost, you know, dropped a load in his trousers, basically. Um, which, you know, if someone seven foot grabs you round the throat, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's the promo. Uh, obviously, that uh, that storyline would, would tick on in future weeks. Um, Cruiserweight Championship now. It is Tajiri versus Jamie Noble. And these two had a storied rivalry for the couple of weeks before um, the, the pay-per-view. Um, Jamie Noble and Nidia were having some relationship problems. The only way they knew how to sort this out was to have a match. They appointed Tajiri as the special guest referee. Obviously, they were palling around a little bit before that. And, uh, yeah, Tajiri tried to save uh, Jamie Noble. <coughs> Sorry, tried to save Nidia from Jamie Noble. They both end up laying into uh, Tajiri after after this. So, um they uh, they decided that this would be leading to a match. Jamie Noble and Nidia obviously making up. Uh, Tajiri um, here is, you know, fully fired up. Jamie Noble uh, is the sort of power move using cruiserweight of the time, uh, using a powerbomb, for example, as his finisher. Um, but the way this one would finish would be Tajiri going for a victory roll. Almost gets it, but uh, Nidia grabs Noble's leg to give the leverage for the win. Um, so, yeah, really, you know, there wasn't much interference here. There was um, a lip lock on Tajiri uh, to try and distract him. Uh, there wasn't much of an interference, but I quite like the way this one was done because... It was done in a way where the referee couldn't get involved um, and couldn't see what was happening. So, um, yeah, really good match. Three cheap shots out of five for this one. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, it's... Um, and then a, uh, a, a, a lip block contest ensues. Afterwards, which would backfire on Noble with Tajiri kicking him in the back of the head. Jamie Noble retains. Um, <clears throat> we next get a backstage segment again. Benoit, that's Chris Benoit, for those of you who don't know who he is, um, tells Eddie Guerrero that Chavo is getting beaten up in the back. Uh, Eddie doesn't believe him to start with. Uh, but he does eventually go to the door that uh, Benoit is um, is telling him to go through. Um, and again, still doesn't believe him. So, ah, oh, no, that's not Charvo. But eventually finds out that it is actually Charvo. And he's been beaten up by Kurt Angle um, behind that door. Uh, of course, this was the um, reversal. The... the um, the I can't even think of retaliation. There we go. That's the word retaliation for what the Guerreros did to uh, Kurt Angle, of course. Um, so and and ultimately, Eddie Guerrero and Chavo aren't in a match on this card. In fact, but uh, Chris Benoit and Kurt Angle are in possibly what could be the match of the night, besides the main event. Um, so we move on now. It is Intercontinental Champion versus World Heavyweight Champion in a unification match. And the culmination of the very rubbish Katie Vick story where Kane had a girlfriend, he drove, he got into an accident, Katie Vick died... Triple H would then proceed to taunt 
cane by climbing in a coffin with a dummy and having intercourse with it whilst wearing a cane mask. Yes, 2002 people. What a year to be alive. Anyway, uh, yeah, so this is a unification match. Don't know why they would do this, to be honest. Um, obviously, the Intercontinental Championship is very storied. I have no idea why they would take the um, Intercontinental Championship away because they were actually planning on getting rid of it completely after this match. Not unifying it and having Triple H with both titles. Maybe then he gave it to Ric Flair or whatever. But they actually considered getting rid of the IC Championship, the Intercontinental Championship. Of course, Kane is the Intercontinental Champion and Triple H is the designated World Heavyweight Champion, as according to Eric Bischoff. Um, and this one is... It's decent. You know, it's what you'd expect from these two um, being absolute veterans of the sport of wrestling, the noble sport of wrestling. And... Um, yeah, it's uh, it's decent, but we get the introduction of Sister Sledge, i.e. the Sledge Hammer, and um, you know uh, that goes into the ribs and shoulder in the corner, and the pedigree uh, ultimately ensues. Obviously, there's a lot of fighting in this one, um, and uh, Ric Flair is there as well. Uh, not a patch on the main match that we'll get to later on in this uh, in this review um, but certainly a decent match I'm going to give this one 3.5 cheap shots out of 5 and um, yeah very much worth a watch uh, like I say not not clear how um, how they came to the idea that it was a good idea to uh, to do what they did. So, I mean, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, Flair comes down to interfere. Uh, Hurricane tries to make the save uh, as, uh, you know, uh, Kane would try and come back. Um, it, it, he would take out Ric Flair. Um, but ultimately, Triple H would get the win. Um, so there you go. That is that match. Triple H is the unified champion now. And uh, we move on from there. So the next match is the WWE Tag Team Championship match. A newly minted championship because the... World Championships are exclusive to Raw. In the brand split, they did sort of like a, a splitting of the titles, hence the introduction of the World Heavyweight Championship and the introduction of the WWE Tag Team Championship and eventually the US Championship as well. Um, so, <clears throat> it would be Benoit and Angle, two people chucked together by Stephanie McMahon, um, who have been given an ultimatum. Basically, if they cannot work together, they'll be suspended for a full year without pay from WWE, from SmackDown. Uh, so they have every reason to work together um, in this one. And on the other side, after coming through their bracket of the championship tournament, and I do miss a good tournament, I've got to admit, now Triple H is in charge. Hopefully we'll get some more tournaments. Maybe even bring back a proper King of the Ring pay-per-view. Um, or even put that on NXT. Now, they, now they've nicked War Games and put it on on uh, Survivor Series. Although that does sound really cool. Um, Rey Mysterio and Edge. Um, very young, fresh-faced Mysterio and Edge. Um, Mysterio obviously making his debut earlier in the year and uh, Edge going newly uh, into his singles career which 
uh, but then obviously getting a tag team championship match here. Well, this match, it's really hard to describe how bloody good this match actually is. You've got Ben Warren Angle, who play the roles of rival tag team partners really, really well. Um, not seen anything like it until Cesaro and Sheamus, uh, where, you know, you, you weren't with either of them, but as soon as they came together, they were this force that were just pretty much unstoppable. Uh, and then you've got Mysterio and Edge. Uh, Mysterio, very quick. Edge, obviously, the stronger of the two, but also very quick. Like to do a bit of jumping, like to do a bit of uh, thumping and all that kind of stuff. Um, but, yeah, I was so engrossed in this match that I didn't make any notes. I didn't even... Oh, actually, no, I did. I did make a note as to how the match finished. All I will say to you on this match, and I do apologise for not being able to describe it, but this match was so good that if I could give it a 6 out of 5 cheap shots, I actually would. Uh, and in fact, I am going to give this the Big Boss seal of approval for best match or of the night. Um, so, great match. The match finishes with the shotgun finish, uh, Edge hitting uh, his finisher, Benoit hit, trying to hit his finisher, Mysterio hitting the 619, but it would end up eventually with the ankle lock locked in on Edge for the win, and Benoit and Angle are the first ever SmackDown WWF or WWE world champions um, and uh, they will go down in history as that duo and this match wow just absolutely insane so good so well structured if you're a student of the game watch this match if you're a tag team uh, tag team wrestler um, brilliant absolutely fantastic wouldn't have expected anything less from all of these guys because they're so good individually they work so well together um you know Mysterio and Angle worked really well together Edge was responsible for Angle losing his hair uh Benoit and Angle have had lots of really good matches as well uh, and uh, obviously Mysterio and Benoit were both in ECW and WCW at the same time, so you know you've got a real good combination of talent in this one. I'm going to give this one five cheap shots out of five, and like I say, the big boss seal of approval. And uh, yeah, really, really, really good match. Um, we move on now, and this uh, the the women now have a huge uh, hole to fill because. The crowd are so out of it because of the last match um, that the, the women sort of got the short straw, I suppose. Um, but it's nice to see them so high up on the card. It is for the Women's Championship. It is Trish, the current Women's Champion, versus Victoria. Um, this one, sadly, didn't get much time uh to work itself out now obviously victoria's come in uh, as a big rival to trish um and they haven't had much time to work together and you can kind of tell you haven't had much time to work together uh that being said i did enjoy the match there were some uh some things in there that they did fluff but ultimately it was a very decent match um you know with trish i've said this many many times trish working so hard to get to the status that she is victoria coming in as an actual women's wrestler uh gave her something different to do uh, but it would be trish to retain the championship with the stratus faction um so no stratus faction sorry is reversed but trish 
gets the roll up for the win. So she didn't get the tra stratisfaction on Victoria. Victoria reversed it. Trish then hit the roll up for the win. Um, not even a surprise roll up. So it's not even the most devastating move in sports entertainment today. After the match, uh, Victoria uh, would just straight out punch Trish in the mouth and uh, she would drop her rival and walk away. I'm going to give this one two cheap shots out of five. Uh, ultimately, kind of fell flat because of how good the match before it was. That being said, it wasn't a bad match at all. Whew. And breathe. Um, so we're going to the world now because it's not WWF New York anymore. So I can't even sing the jingle. But it's which jobber is at WWE The World in New York. It is Rikishi, the man with the behind, uh, the ass man. Oh no, that was uh, that's that's Billy Gunn. Who has now progressed to daddy ass. Anyway, got to put a little ass on it. Rikishi is at the world. He talks about the Hell in a Cell and his one match that he had where he got thrown off the top of the Hell in a Cell by The Undertaker into a truck full of straw and uh, wood shavings. Um, still, you know, one of the most memorable Hell in a Cell matches um, that we've seen uh, that took place in Armageddon 2000. You can find that retro review on the channel. We did start in 2020, doing 20 years before, obviously. Um, so yeah, you've got uh, you got that to uh, to go and have a look at. I'll try and put a link in the description as well. Um, when he talks about how dangerous it is. Uh, and of course, that that match was the sixth. I think it was it the first ever six. It was the first ever. I think it was the only six man Hell in a Cell where they were all singles competitors. We have had tag team uh, matches in there. We've had two on ones, three on ones um, in Hell in a Cells, um, but uh, never anything else really you know i'd like to see that concept come back but then you've got the elimination chamber which uh, would ultimately sort of take the place of that and be much better because you know it was released in in timers so it's like the royal rumble and hell in a cell all in one which was cool um so if we go on to the main event we go on to the main event. What can you say about this main event? It is a damn near perfect main event. Hell in a Cell match. And for my money, this could possibly be the best Hell in a Cell match we have ever seen on WWE television. Undertaker versus Brock Lesnar. It had the storyline behind it. You had two guys at the top of the game. Undertaker's obviously been in the industry for... Well, he'd been in WWE for 12 years at this point. Obviously, he was wrestling a lot longer than that. Probably uh, is about a 20-year veteran at this point in time. Brock Lesnar just coming through. Youngest ever WWE champion. And, uh, yeah, Undertaker's going to try and stop him. He's got a broken hand. And uh, Stephanie's decree that... Um, Undertaker can wear his cast in the Hell in a Cell, and that would play out as one of the major talking points for this match. Um, doesn't take them long to get busted open. There's blood everywhere, the gushing, <coughs> and it is true they do they do bleed, um, and if you do it wrong, it can go wrong. Uh, even Paul Heyman has a go at his extreme brand of wrestling by having his tie pulled through the hell in a cell in one of the most hilarious things I have ever seen a manager do and a manager be involved with. Undertaker grabs his tie and pulls him into the cell several times on purpose. Uh, 
Um, and uh, yeah, then then Paul Heyman is is bloodied up. Um, so yeah, this this patch it's crazy, man. There's 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 chairs, there's stairs. Obviously, they use the cell quite a bit. This one they don't go out of the cell, um, which is pretty cool. So they actually make it a whole match inside the cell. They don't spend much time in the ring, obviously, only to get the win at the end. <coughs> um, after Undertaker had pulled Brock Lesnar into the cell several times, uh, it would be then Brock Lesnar getting the better of the Undertaker and Paul Heyman putting the belt, putting his belt around the Undertaker's arm, who would who would then hold on to it like a like a sort of hangman thing with his broken arm. Uh, Brock Lesnar would then go at the Undertaker's broken arm with a weapon and uh, really sort of lay into it, playing through the story. <coughs> the Undertaker had a pain-killing shot before the match, uh, begging the trainer to, to do it, otherwise he wouldn't get through. Uh, and he did manage to get through. Ultimately, Brock Lesnar would pull the cast off, which obviously is, you know, a big major talking point. Probably the only thing that I can uh, sort of question, really, on this one. And, uh, yeah, <coughs> from there, Brock would go in for the kill like a shark smelling blood. Uh, Undertaker would come back... Um, and uh, ultimately would succumb to the F5, having uh, tried to hit the tombstone. And um, what a match. What a really, really just... What an amazing match. It, it, like I say, it is possibly, for me, the best Hell in a Cell match in history. Um, better than the first one. Um better than the Undertaker Mankind ones uh, because they they don't go out of the cell and they use the cell for exactly what it is and what it's made for, exactly what it needs. Um, it's just a fantastic match. Love both of these guys and love the fact that they were in this match together. Dare I say that this would be Another six out of six out of five, if I could do it. But we're going to get two five cheap shots out of fives on one pay per view, and another big boss seal of approval for this match. Um, really, just one heck of a fantastic pay per view. If you're looking for something to watch in uh, that's a bit old school then, you know, why not go to No Mercy? Really good. Fantastic. I think this is probably one of the only modern... Uh, one of the only modern pay-per-views I've actually got on DVD. Uh, because it was that good. Um, you know, apart from having um, WrestleMania 20, 21 and 22 on DVD and a couple of compilations... I don't have many wrestling DVDs. Don't need them anymore. They're all on the network, isn't it? Hashtag 999. Yes, you can give me a free subscription if you like. Anyway, um, yeah, so that is No Mercy. As Brock retains and celebrates on top of the cell, uh, we go closer to 2003. And actually, it's the most rounded pay-per-view of 2002 um, brilliant from start to finish. I was absolutely hooked. Bear in mind, I like I say, I watched this on holiday, and uh, it was about probably one o'clock in the morning when I finished this. Didn't sleep at one point ever. Um, also watched Extreme Rules, and again, two thousand two Extreme Rules, really good pay per view. Um, but we are on retros, so. Yes, I think this might be the most rounded pay-per-view in 2002. And there were some bloody good pay-per-views in 2002, including WrestleMania 18. So, yeah, um, really good. Fantastic. 
and we move on to Survivor Series in November. So, that leaves me to say thank you very much for watching and or listening if you're joining us for the brand new podcast. And uh, we'll see you in November for Survivor Series. Looking forward to this one. There is a first on this show. And, uh, yeah, it's going to be a really good one. Really good one. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Please make sure you like and subscribe. And I will see you next time. Retro wrestling fans, goodbye. Hiya!